Welcome to another Madam Money class. Hi, I am Tara Jackson, AKA Madam Money, and I am here to facilitate your learning, to make sure you get the insider information about all things dealing with your income, with money, investing, insurance, oh God, credit, everything you can think of dealing with money. And I am here to make sure you know what you need to know to make sure you make more, you keep more, and you grow more of your income and your money. And tonight's class is no different. The, tonight's class is for my freelancers, okay? So all of my freelancers that are like me, we freelance for blogs. I have a blog, but I also freelance. Um, maybe you freelance graphic, uh, graphic design. Maybe you freelance photography. Maybe you freelance, you know, whatever. Whatever you freelance, this class is for you. We want to teach you how to make sure you make more money, you keep more money, and you grow more money as a freelancer. Because being an entrepreneur is a little bit different than being a freelancer. Even though as a freelancer you're an entrepreneur, there are some things that you really need to consider as a freelancer. We're fruit, but we're different types of fruits. Get it? Get it? Okay. The products and services that we share are talents versus selling a, a lotion or selling a product. When we freelance, we're selling our skills, our talent, our knowledge base, okay? So that's what freelancing is versus selling a product um, or, or service for that matter. So we want to make sure that you have it. And I have the best person in the world. So, of course, y'all know I have the best social media friends. Social media friends to a point where I've never met them before face to face, but I've connected with them either on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. We've been Facebook, social media friends for years. And then when I said, you know what, I have a class, I need a class for this. They're like, yeah, I'll teach and I'll help you with that. They just come through for me for just whatever, just because I asked them. That's so freaking awesome. So I am so excited to have one of my favorite Twitter friends, met her on Twitter through my cast chat, Wealth with Mina, um, at Wealth with Mina. And she participated in my cast chat, Twitter chat for years. And I promise you, just only 15 minutes ago, I got to see her lovely face in person via this conversation, right? So I'm just so, and she's gorgeous. She has a, she has a nerve to be beautiful. <laughs> I love social media friends that are smart. And then when you meet them for the first time, they're absolutely gorgeous. Like me. I'm just saying. Birds of a feather. Hey. Together. Hey. I got Miss Mina Black. Girl, it's so, so awesome to meet you face to face. You are absolutely beautiful. Not only your looks are beautiful, but I have known you, you, you know your stuff. You're very intelligent and I'm a sapiosexual. So I love intelligent people regardless. And I so appreciate everything that you're doing in the movement of money. So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Yay. Absolutely. So um, before we get started with you and talking about the fun financial tips for freelancers, wanted to make sure we talk about my upcoming events. Y'all, I'm going to Cali. I'm leaving Thursday. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm leaving Thursday for my boss con. I took my boss brunch from the East Coast, brought it to the West Coast and called it boss con, a mini boss conference for my uh, business owners, entrepreneurs and professionals to teach you how to expand your brand. So I wanted to expand my brand. So I went to the West Coast, but I got all of the experts from that area and from across the country who are flying in to teach you how to expand your brand. So whether you're a recording artist, whether you are a speaker, an author, whatever, if you want to be known nationally and internationally, you really need to go to Boss Con to learn how to expand your brand. And you can get the information at bossbrunch.net. But here's the thing, today is the last day to register. I gotta give the count to the hotel. So, you know, it is what it is. So if you want to go and you want to be with me in California, if you're in the LA area, um, right near Hollywood, I'm in Culver City, if you want to connect with me out there, go to bossbrunch.net, get the information, that's all I have to say. 
You'll see all the speakers and everything. But tonight is all about the class. It's all about freelancers and some fun financial tips for freelancers. And that's why I have my lovely Mina Black from In the Black Financial Wellness dot com here woo woo so and i love that because her last name is black and it's in the black you get it <laughs> <laughs> just for those that are a little bit slow you get it for those in the back <laughs> in the black um the black just, for those that are a little bit slow get it it's so awesome go in the black financial wellness.com learn all about her and everything that she does but Mina Black, thank you for joining us. Um, before we get started, tell us a little bit about you and what you do in this world of money fabulousness. Ooh, oh my goodness, what do I do? I do a little bit of everything. And what that means is um, I have been an advisor for since 2006. Um, I started off working for one of the largest wealth management firms, Merrill, Merrill Lynch. Um, and I branched off and went off my own uh, doing financial planning and investment management for my own clients. And nowadays I teach people about personal finance um, through workshops. I, um, one of my favorite things to do is uh, go into a corporation and teach their employees um, about personal finance, everything from budgeting to investing, which is my specialty. Nice. I love it. And I love the fact that you are actually a financial advisor. So here's the thing. To be a financial advisor, you have to have certain credentials, right? So you have to have your series, what's called a series seven, series 63, all of those series. So that makes you legal to talk about certain things, right? And so the reason, the only reason why I did not go for Mina, the only reason why I did not go for my series is because FINRA, you know, the girlfriend Fenra, yeah. she doesn't like me being on social media as much as I am. That's true. You know, Fenra. So yeah. I just, I, I, it was a business decision, just like Susie Orman, just like all of those. It was a business decision. And how do I get around that? I connect with lovely people like you that can talk about certain things that I, you know, even though I can speak on it, not legally can't do it because I do so much in social media. So I need, still need to connect my social media network with the information. That's why I connect people with you. Um, you because if, yeah, exactly. FINRA is not really up with social media yet, but God bless them. They have a ways to go. Yeah, got a ways to go. But I'm just so glad to have a chocolate lady in that space with their series seven to talk about certain things but we're not going to be talking about investments we're going to talk about i mean a little bit about investments but we're really going to be talking about what are certain things that us freelancers uh, whether we freelance articles for magazines we freelance blogs um articles for blogs whether we free freelance services whether we freelance graphic designing whether we freelance whatever we freelance as freelancers we need to manage our money a certain way mm -hmm. so as we get started one of the things i have to ask you is what is the first thing freelancers should know about their finances so one of the things i always tell people is before you even start or even think about becoming a freelancer you have to ask yourself, are you good with money? Because if you're not good with money before you become a freelancer, it's going to be a mess after you become a freelancer. So make sure that you understand your finances. Do you actually track your expenses? Unfortunately, most people hate that B word, budget. You know, And if you don't track your expenses now, it's going to be a lot more difficult once you become a freelancer. The right. second thing is, are you good with sales and marketing? How are you going to generate business? You've heard me say this before, Tara, cash flow is everything in small business. And if you don't know how to generate income, you're going to be in trouble. So can you generate some type of revenue at some point, whether it's 90 days after you go live, six to six months, at some point you have to be able to generate revenue. And the last thing is, uh, especially can you afford it? Being a freelancer, going out on your own and becoming self-employed, unfortunately, is very expensive for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So before you even start, my first question would be, do you have enough savings set aside? Because one of the things that comes with being a freelancer is the period known as feast or famine, and there will be some slow periods. So what are you gonna do during those slow periods in the downtimes? Make sure that you have something set aside 
during those downtimes, or at a minimum, you have revenue coming in that, that is essentially going to be sustain, able to sustain you moving forward. So I hope before you get started that you think about how you currently manage your finances. If you aren't good with money now, that's okay. The goal is to get you to the point where you're okay with money, and more importantly, you're okay with money as a personal fun, a, a freelancer. That's very important. And one of the things you said first is being able to track your expenses. Like if you have a hard time tracking your expenses, your personal expenses, you're going to have a hard time tracking your business expenses. Yeah. So start, uh, start with your personal expenses and get used to that. The best way, I mean, I do it through mint.com e easily. It, okay. It's just easy for me to wake up in the morning. You know, if you got, if you hit Facebook every morning, when you wake up, you can hit mint.com. I, I, the first thing I hit is mint.com, then I go to my social media networks while I'm half, half awake and half asleep. So it's mint. Well, actually it's mint. It is um, a couple of my investment sites. <laughs> and then it's Facebook and then it's Twitter. Okay, so yeah, I do that. Sit with my phone next to me. Don't judge. Don't judge me. But I know where my money is. I know where my money's going. And then I go to social media. The next thing you said is you got to understand sales. You, 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 you know, everybody keeps talking about, I'm not a salesperson. I'm not that. Well, if you're not a salesperson, then you don't need to be in business for yourself. Exactly. Because in order for you to make money, you have to sell your own products and services, right? So mm -hmm. we, we got lazy. We got a job. Mina, we got a job. And the problem is, is that our job did all the sales and marketing, brought all the people to us so we can do a lot of work, right? So we thought it was going to be easy to do our own business. But what we didn't realize is all the work that the salespeople do. But since we have our own business now, we got to do the work of the salespeople the sales and marketing departments. And you gotta set a budget for your sales and marketing, okay? So you gotta make sure that you have a sales and marketing to bring in the customer so you can bring in the revenue. Exactly. So I completely understand all of that that you're saying. So thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely, I think one thing that most people overlook is that everybody's a salesperson, whether you realize it or not. Yes. So what happens when you go in for an interview? You're selling yourself to that employer, right? You want that person to hire you based on your skill set, based on your resume. So whether you re realize it or not, even dating, hello. Hello. <laughs> you were Come trying on, y'all. Y'all knew I was going to take it there, right? <laughs> you're trying to sell yourself, right? You put on your best face, your best face, your best self, you know, and you hope, you hope things work out. So whether we realize it or not, we're all salespeople. We just need to change how we think about sales. Well, and it's being a good salesperson is one of the best skill sets you can have in life. And that is actually a quote from Mr. George Foreman. And you know what he's known for? The Foreman Grill. He sold Absolutely. That. Absolutely. So, Everyone so is a good salesperson because yeah. you either sold your employer to hire you, exactly. you sold your spouse to marry you, you yes. sold your significant other to date you, you yeah. even sold the stranger to sleep with you. I'm not yes. saying, I'm not judging. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay, so everybody is a good, so if you're such a good salesperson for all of that, then you need to be your good salesperson for your entrepreneurial venture, for your freelancing work and all of that. You can do it. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely, okay. So how should freelancers organize their file? Because as a freelancer, I, I don't know about y'all, but I'm not the most organized person. I have organized confusion. <laughs> Don't judge, okay? So if I have a stack of papers on my desk, mm -hmm. I know that whatever you need is right here. Now, mm -hmm. it might not be in a neat little file or a neat little stack or whatever, but I know it's right here. But when you become a freelancer, especially when you're dealing with money, you need to organize something, whether it's a pile or whether it's a file, you need to be able to organize. So how do or how should freelancers organize their files so this is one of the things I think most of us have problems with which is I have piles and piles of paperwork I have piles and piles of receipts what do I do with all of that right so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the free let's start with the free way to do things you can do this old-school way the old-school way meaning you get your shoebox you dump all your paperwork your receipts in it right and then come tax time when it comes time when you need the actual paperwork you can pull everything out I'm not the biggest fan of that uh, method because it makes it a little hard, especially 
if things start picking up in your freelance business, it makes it a little hard to keep track of everything. I'm a big fan of digital and dig, uh, digitizing everything, all my paperwork. So one of the things that I use is Evernote, right? Um, and Evernote has this great app called Scannable. So if you download um, Scannable on either Android or iOS, you can literally scan your receipts, all your paperwork, and save it to your Evernote file. Now, Evernote has a free version, and then they also have a paid premium version. If you want, you can do the free version. The only thing about the free version is that I believe you only get up to like 60 megabytes worth of mm -hmm. storage, whereas yeah. with the paid uh, premium version, which is, uh, I believe, $34, starts at $34 per year, you get, I believe, 10 gigabytes of uh, worth of uh, storage, which is great for freelancers when you're uh, first starting out. Mm -hmm. I highly, highly recommend using a software to digitize all your paperwork and organizing it. Take a scan of your receipt whenever you have a receipt. And this is one thing most people overlook, whether it is you're getting on the subway, the, tr um, the train, or um, you go out with friends. And you know what? If you talk about your business, right? One of the uh, best books I've ever read is actually all about how to minimize your taxes. And it includes tips like how to minimize your taxes and save all your receipts from just regular dining with uh, strangers or whoever, and how you can go about uh, essentially digitizing your entire uh, all your receipts and digitizing all your paperwork. But if possible, try to move away from having stacks and stacks of paperwork. Yes. Because every time you have something in hand, whether it's an invoice that you need to send out, send out to a client or it's a, a, a check that you received. For most of us nowadays, we don't go to the bank and deposit a check. What do we do? We take a picture, right? And send it, through our, uh, send it to our bank that way. When you do that, you can also send a copy to your uh, scannable if you choose to download that app or whatever digital software you use to manage your or um, manage your files You can also do the other old school way, which is get a receipt organizer Staples sells it for like six dollars and fifty cents, which is pretty affordable or you can use the file folder But I'm not the biggest fan of that as I said Because of the fact that it's hard to track and make, track and search and find things when you need it Right Well, one of the other apps that I love is mile IQ Yes. I love my IQ because it tracks my mileage. Mm -hmm. And so now my accountant, who is my ride or die, but before she was my ride or die, she was just my accountant. And she used to cuss me out every year, right? Like, Tara, what's your mileage? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Tara, what's your freaking mileage? Like, you need to know your mileage. You, you use your car for business. You're, you're losing money if you don't know your mileage. So I had to look through all of my appointments on my calendar and all of this crap and estimate and guesstimate. And I found this app called My Like You. I will put it in the comments for everyone to get access to my, oh, I love that freaking app. Because if I don't save anything else, I know my mileage now. <laughs> Which is a good. I get a lot back for my mileage. Good. See, you know what? And that's one of the deductions most people overlook because we're not very good at tracking our mileage, you know? Between Mile IQ and uh, Expensify, which is, a, which is another great app that you can use to track your miles, uh, I think if you pick whichever software you want, but the goal is to make sure that you're actually tracking because you know what? When you don't, you're throwing money out the window. Exactly. Exactly. And Mad Money doesn't want you to throw any more money out the window. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. So what is the best way to for freelancers to track their spending? You know, whether it's, you know, yeah, I got my receipts and everything like that. But what's the best way to track the spending as a freelancer? So one of the things I always tell people, um, whether it's for your personal finances or your uh, business finances, is you need to make sure that you understand what your expenses are every month. So you have your fixed expenses, right? Oh, you know what? I have um, my rent or my mortgage or um, groceries or my transportation. That's your fixed expenses, right? Make sure you have uh, that lined up properly in your um, budget. And then you also have your discretionary expenses, right? Make sure that you know what amount you can actually spend on discretionary because most of us, unfortunately, this is where we run afoul of our budget because we get a little too happy and we end up going out a little bit more than we should or eating out a little bit more than we should, right? And then the other category is what I call the mandatory expenses. Now, mandatory for freelancers is your taxes, your retirement, and your insurance. If you don't have money set aside for those three things as a freelancer, you are going to end up in big trouble come the following tax season the following year. 
So if possible, split your budget and your spending into those three categories, your fixed, your discretionary, your mandatory expenses. And then if possible, what I always tell people is, once you know how much your fixed expenses are, you can start working on saving and then minimize the amount and lower the percentage of your discretionary. So for example, if I'm a freelancer, right, I know that let's say I have monthly expenses of $1,500 per month and that's my fixed expenses, right? Well, you know what? I still have two other categories to worry about, the discretionary and the mandatory, right? So bringing in $1,500 a month is not going to be enough for me to sustain my current lifestyle. I need to bring in a little bit more than that in order for me to sustain it my lifestyle at a minimum 20 to 30 percent more than that because remember taxes and retirement and insurance and taxes that's how they get you absolutely absolutely so that is great advice especially with those taxes and the savings i'm just saying work it out work it out so how should or how can freelancers analyze their earnings. So we're making money. Mm -hmm. The money is, is, is called earnings. So mm -hmm. what is the best way or how can freelancers analyze the earnings? So I, I, what I find with some, some freelancers is when they first get started or if they've even been in business for a little, a little while, they're not very good at tracking what's coming in. They just know that, you know what, um, <laughs> I sent out an invoice and the person paid me. Unfortunately, they don't always pay on time. So if possible, what I always tell people is go back 90 days and figure out what your average income is per month. And if you don't know, or if you're just starting out, track whatever um, your income will be for the next six months and use that as your guide for creating a, a budget, not just your business budget, but your personal budget as well. Because you know what? The thing that I, what I do for myself is I have my uh, personal expenses, my personal budget, but I also have line items for all of our business expenses to make sure that whatever <laughs> requirements, whatever stuff are mandatory for my business is accounted for within our personal expenses because that money has to come from somewhere. It's not going to come out of the sky. So if possible, make sure you go back at least 90 days at a minimum and track down all your pay stubs. And if possible, go back to last year or at least three years for your tax returns if you've been in business for at least three years and figure out what your annual uh, annual income is and use that as your guide when you're creating your, uh, your budget. But in order to do that, you must track down any invoice that you sent out. Going back to Tara's comment earlier about mint.com, this is where apps like mint.com or wave apps come in handy. You have to have a way of tracking what's coming in and what's going out. And if you don't at the moment, I urge you to stop whatever it is you're doing and sign up for one of those, one of those software, um, software apps, whether it's mint or wave, it doesn't matter. Just sign up ASAP because you need to be able to track what's coming in and what's going out. I absolutely agree. And that leads me to my next question of what type of tools or apps that freelancers can use to manage their finances. Um, my favorite, of course, is um, mint.com, as well as, uh, what is it called? Oh my God, my accountant's gonna kill me. Um, it is online. Um, what's that accounting software? Wave or um, FreshBooks or Zero or which one? No. Expensive My, QuickBooks? Emily, don't kill me. Don't kill me. I know it. I know it. QuickBooks. QuickBooks oh, online. QuickBooks? That's how my... QuickBooks online. Okay. I don't know why I forgot it because I live by it because it goes straight to her. So my mint.com and my QuickBooks online have their apps. And so with the QuickBooks, the QuickBooks, it, for my business account, it automatically downloads all of my transactions. So I use my business debit card for everything or my business credit card for everything so that all of those transactions goes down into the QuickBooks online. And then my accountant can see all those and can count, um, categorize those expenses, whether it's meals and entertainment, whether it's uh, marketing, whether it's business expenses, business phone, or whatever. So that is an app that saved my life with my accountant. And then of course, mint.com, I use it for personal so that I can track my personal. And if you wanna tie it to your business account, you can do that as well. You can set up budgets um, in mint.com. You can also um, set up uh, payments. You can do a lot of things through mint. So those are my two that are my favorite to manage and you know manage my expenses what are some other ones that you know of 
Well, so the most common one is uh, QuickBooks. That's what most people use. Um, for people that are looking for, us, for example, a free version, uh, Wave App, I believe the website is uh, waveapp.com, um, is a great tool for you to, if possible, link your business account. Again, going back to the type, um, the type of spending and keep tracking your spending, link your business account. And at the end of the year, all you have to do is literally download everything, hand it off to your accountant. And by the way, if possible, try not to do your taxes, your business taxes, your freelance <laughs> taxes yourself. Get say, say, say that app again. You, I can't really hear you, but say you that are. app again. Wave, W-A-V-E app, A-P-P, waveapp.com is the website. Um, and it's one of these free accounting um, apps that you can literally link your accounts. One of the things I like about Wave also is that you can actually send out invoices to people um, through the app as well. Um, but you can link your accounts and at the end of the year, just literally download all, all your um, transactions, send it over to your accountant and let them get to work, right? Um, Expensify is another one uh, for those that are um, interested in uh, um, a little bit more uh, kind of a higher priced model. And then there's Concur. Concur is used by a lot of the big firms. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for freelancers. If for freelancers, I stick with some of the other um, uh, more e easy to use apps like QuickBooks software, like QuickBooks and, uh, and um, Wave apps or even uh, FreshBooks. Nice, nice, nice. So we, we understand how to track our expenses. So let's talk about savings. What type of account should freelancers have for savings um, and putting money aside? Because I think that's very important that we should allocate some money for savings. So one thing I, I always tell people is, um, let's talk a little bit about how we put everything together. So let's just say I'm a freelancer and I'm very excited. I got a client to pay me. <laughs> Yay, I'm happy, right? The client paid me. I deposit the money in a spending account, right? In my business checking account that you've opened, hopefully, um, as a freelancer, you opened up a business checking account. Once that money is deposited, your goal is to especially make sure that the money is split up in several different accounts. You want a percentage going to your emergency savings. Remember, as emergency savings, because remember, we need to get through those feast of fam or famine periods, right? At a minimum, you need to make sure that that account at least has three months worth of your living expenses if you're single. And then if you're married, at least six months worth of your living expenses saved, saved up. The second account type that you want is taxes. Yes, remember, Uncle Sam, he wants to get paid. So at a minimum, make sure that 20%, uh, depending on where you live. So for example, here in New York is a little bit more. Um, than 20 percent um maybe 30 40 percent of whatever that income that comes in goes into that tax account and then you want to make sure that another percentage goes toward your retirement account now the percentage that goes into your retirement account uh can vary it can be 10 percent. it can be five percent it all it's all dependent on one the income that's coming in and also the type of retirement account that you set up so those three type three main uh, type account types your emergency savings the tax account or retirement accounts are the first places the funds should go. Remember, pay yourself first, and then you pay everything else. The next category is your spending account. So whatever is remaining is what's gonna be used to fix expenses, right? And once the fixed expenses are taken care of is when you move down to your discretionary expense, uh, your discretionary spending, right? So make sure you take care of the stuff, the necessities, right? The three accounts, emergency, tax, and retirement, and possibly if you have if, um, healthcare and insurance, if you don't have insurance, that's also another type of account. And then make sure once that's taken care of, you pay for your bills and the fixed expenses, and then you focus on your retire, excuse me, your discretionary expenses, right? Now, the type of retirement account that you set up, for most freelancers, what I normally tell them is, let's figure out how much is coming in on an annual basis, because you can set up the IRA, the Roth IRA, the SEP mm -hmm. IRA, or the individual 401k. Okay. Lots of so let's talk about each of those. So um, for those of, you know, a lot of us may know what they are, but for those of us who don't know what they are, so we know traditional IRAs, that is before taxes. Usually if you have income from an employer before taxes, those are the traditional IRAs. Roth IRAs after tax money. Right. So you paid all your taxes, you have your net income, and now you want to contribute so you don't have to pay taxes later. That is a Roth IRA. So explain to us what a SEP IRA is. So a SEP IRA is a simplified employee pension IRA, and it's uh, good for small business owners. If you're a freelancer, you can set one up. 
The only thing about SEP IRA is that if you have an employee or employees, you have to contribute uh, to that uh, to the SEP IRA for all employees the same um, the same amount, and the employee can contribute uh, an IRA component. So for those that are familiar with IRAs and tra uh, traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs, for example, the maximum this year is fifty five hundred. So if I'm an employee, right, and I work for um, a company and my company is run by a freelancer and that person set up SEP IRA, they're going to contribute uh, the employer contribution and me, the employee, I'm going to contribute the employee contribution, which is just the IRA, which is a maximum of $5,500 per year, right? So that's a SEP IRA, right? Mm -hmm. The other type is the individual 401k, mm -hmm. which is one, if you're familiar with 401ks, if you ever worked for a company that has a 401k, is essentially the tax deferred way for you to save for retirement. It can be pre-tax or, or um, after tax, right? The solo 401k or individual 401k, the reason why that's good for a lot of freelancers is because there's no setup fee and there's no maintenance fee to set it up. Um, no, no maintenance fee to maintain it, right? The only catch with the individual 401k is though is you can't have employees. The only employee you can have is your spouse. A significant other right the other employee can't even be a common law <laughs> a common law um spouse it has to be an actual uh, your married uh, spouse right but right. it's good for a lot of freelancers because you know what you can contribute a ton of money like for 2017 it's 54,000 or something like that um for 2014 right into an account and set aside that amount of money for tax for um retirement and the good thing about that is obviously the fact that it's tax deferred right? You don't, you're not paying any taxes on that contribution, right? Um, can uh, obviously go a long way towards your tax planning later on, right? The other type of account is called the simple IRA, but it's not necessarily the best for freelancers. Um, it's for companies that have 100 or fewer employees. I wouldn't recommend it for you if you're a freelancer. If you're a freelancer, if you're just starting out and you're not quite sure what type of income you're going to have, look into the IRA or the Roth IRA or the individual 401k. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, as a freelancer and your individual, you don't have employees, I would kind of recommend the individual 401k. Um, that's just me, but that's why we have Miss Mina Black on here that can consult you more within that. So make sure you connect with Mina Black and we'll give her contact information afterwards. So what should freelancers or what should we know about tax planning? So if you're a freelancer, <laughs> One of the things I always tell people when it comes to growing wealth in this country is uh, there are a number of ways to grow wealth in this country, right? <laughs> you can work hard for somebody else or work hard for yourself, right? And if you work hard for yourself, one of the ways to grow you know, your wealth exponentially is to understand tax planning and to, to do some really great tax planning. And if you're a freelancer, one of the things you need to know is, okay, how am I going to set up my, um, at my a freelancing company? I don't recommend you go with the entity type that is a sole proprietorship um, for the simple reason that if you happen to get sued, knock on wood, that, and hopefully this never happens, unfortunately, they can come after your personal assets, right? If hopefully you'll set up another type of entity, such as an LLC, an S Corp. I wouldn't recommend a C Corp if you're a freelancer um, until you're huge, huge, and then you're no longer a freelancer, a huge, um, and you have a lot of income coming in. If you can try to stick with either the LLC or the S Corp, they're both passed through, meaning whatever income you earn is passed through your individual um, taxes. Um, and hopefully, if something happens, they can't come after, if, some, if something happens, meaning lawsuit, they can't come after you, they'll come after your company, all right? So that's the first thing. Figure out what type of entity you want to form, right? Um, what type of entity you want to form. Next, understand how you're going to be taxed. So most freelancers, if you're profitable, you Remember, you're going to have to pay self-employment tax. Um, hopefully, you are profitable within the first year or so of being in business. Um, if not, then obviously, you know what? That's something you and your accountant have to talk about. There are ways to essentially carry over the last two following years. But I, ideally, hopefully, you have some income coming in. But remember, you're responsible for all your taxes because if you have any income coming in, remember, the government wants to, pay, get, um, wants to make sure that you're paying taxes because if you're an employee of a big corporation or any other company, what happens? They automatically withdraw your taxes, right? Whether it's um, Social, Security, <laughs> Social Security, Medicare, all that is withdrawn from your, um, from your paycheck automatically. Well, now that you're self-employed, somebody, um, somebody has to deduct those taxes and that person is you, right? So make sure that you speak with an accountant uh, you can go to a CPA or an enrolled agent. Enrolled agents 
are the ones that are actually able to talk to uh, IRS. They're very good. They're almost actually as good as CPAs. Um, that I, at least that's what I found with a lot of uh, enrolled agents. And the last thing you want to do is make sure you take advantage of deductions. I don't know how many people overlook deductions when they're tax planning. There's so many deductions that you can take advantage of. There's a great book um, by this uh, company. They call it J.K. Lasser's uh, 1001 on yeah. Deductions for Small Business Owners. I'd highly, highly recommend taking a look at it. They publish it every year, and it's updated based on um, the tax uh, law changes. Right. But if possible, make sure you understand all deductions, all the deductions that are afforded to you, whether it's your, if you work out of your home, mm -hmm. you know what? You need to be able to deduct um, your uh a portion, <laughs> not all of your, your not all of it, but a portion, you're absolutely right. The portion that's, um, that you use for your houses. And the last thing, make sure you set up the quarterly estimated taxes. Um, through, you can use the IRS's uh, website to set it up uh, on a regular basis. But the way that that quarterly estimated taxes work is you get, um, you have to pay it in the quarter that you actually have income coming in. So mm -hmm. if you don't get, if you don't have any income coming in for one quarter, let's say you went the entire quarter and nothing came in. You can use what's called the annualized income system to go ahead and make your payments. But your goal is to not be caught off guard the following year when you're doing your taxes. And that's what the quarterly estimated ta uh, taxes are for. Yes. And, and, I, and I absolutely agree. And I, we actually did a, I did a webinar on taxes and how to get the most money out of your taxes. So I will definitely put a link um, in the video and also send it to those that registered so that you all can look at the free webinar to talk about. And it was with Edeline Dryden, the tax expert, who talked about the different um, tax deductions and the difference between deductions and all that stuff. So we have the resources and everything, so I'll make sure that we post it and send it to those that registered so you can watch the free, um, the free webinar, but also if you want more details, there's options for that as well. So. Absolutely, Mina. You're absolutely on point with that. Um, now, what's the best ways for freelancers to manage their insurance needs? Because, you know, as a freelancer, now you, there's some there's a lot of insurance needs, and of course, I'm a licensed insurance agent. I can talk all day with that, but I want y'all to hear from the expert because I'm not trying to sell y'all insurance, but y'all need to understand that even as an independent freelancer, there's some risk that's there and there's some liability that's there and that's what the insurance is there to protect us. But how can we manage our finance, our re insurance needs or what are, you know, what do we need to know about the insurance as a freelancer? So if you're a freelancer um, and as Tara mentioned when we first started, you're essentially selling your skills, you're selling your knowledge, right? Um, and one of the things that uh, most people over, uh, overlook is the fact that you need insurance for that very reason, because you're selling your your knowledge, some people may question your knowledge set. <laughs> and some people may say, you know what, you gave me the wrong information. So one of the things I always tell people is make sure you have some type of liability, professional liability insurance I, I, as a freelancer, because heaven forbid somebody decides that, you know what, I don't like what you told me or you, you did something wrong. I, one of my former coworkers got sued because the client didn't like the investments, um, how their investments did, right? One of my former um, a co-worker, he's a, an advisor. And as a result, thankfully, his professional liability insurance, his e and insurance kicked in um, as, a res uh, as a result of that. However, had he not had it, he would have had to come out of pocket a lot of money. So make sure that you have some type of professional liability insurance, right? Make sure, you, if possible, you can get a business owner's policy. Um, and one of the things that I always tell people is, don't forget about the basic insurance, right? Disability healthcare, who's paying for all that as a freelancer? Remember, if you were formally employed, your employer probably provided that, right? And all of that was calculated as part of your income, whether you realize or not, whatever you tell people your salary is, whether it's 30, 40, 50,000, 100,000, it's not really your salary, right? Because you got to add in the cost of insurance, right? So if you're insured, if you tell people I make 100, well, it's 100 plus, whatever the cost of actually employing you is, right? right. So, so exactly. make sure that you at least have, at a minimum, health insurance, disability insurance, disability, um, if possible, life insurance, depending on your current circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. and now, if you're, uh, again, going back to um, whether or not you're single or married, if you're single or married, it doesn't matter. If you have debt, 
like a lot of people do. <laughs> Remember, not all debt goes away when you pass away, yeah. unfortunately. Right. Like, uh, all debt go away. The debt does not die with the debtor. It does not die with the debtor, unfortunately. I wish it was the case, but unfortunately, there have been many, many, many cases whereby the debtor passed away and the creditors went after either family members or they just started harassing. Or they go, it, it, this has happened several of my clients where the client, my client passed away, but the family member was a co-signer on a student loan. Exactly. And so one of the, one of the things in all of your credit agreements with any financial institution, how do you go in default? One of the default methods is if you die. Yeah. So if you die, you're in default. And so the ownership of the debt now transfers to the co-signer or it remains solely on the co-applicant or the joint owner. Mm -hmm. So if you have joint obligations, co-signing obligations with anyone, you need insurance. I don't care if you're married or, or you know, single, especially if you own uh, student loan debt and your parents co-sign for the student loan debt, you do not want to leave that debt to your family members as a financial hardship. You do not want that to be your legacy. So I don't care if you're 22 and you're single, if you have joint obligations, if your parents co-sign with you on anything, you need some life insurance unless you have a whole stack of money sitting somewhere to go into the grave with you. I, I don't know how else to, to put it on there, you know? So anytime you have joint obligations, especially if you're single, you need life insurance. If you don't have joint obligations, but you have a family and they're solely relying on your income, especially as a freelancer, because your employer is, you don't have an employer or you may have an employer, but what if you leave the employer? If you leave the employer, the insurance doesn't go with you. So you have to make sure that you own something is there. That's my soapbox on insurance. And I, I think you brought up a couple of really, really great points there as far as not, um, when you're a co-signer, right? If you um, are starting a small business, if you become a freelancer and you say, oh, you know what? I'm going to go out and take a loan to get out of some type of debt and I'm going to have mommy, daddy, grandparents, grandmama, grandpappy, because they want to see me succeed. I'm going to have them co-sign this particular debt, keep in mind, if something happens, they're on the hook for that debt in addition to you, right? So make sure that you at least are thinking of them if they decide to co- I'm, I'm not a big fan of co-signing. I think- Me uh, neither. I, I think- <laughs> Me okay. neither. I, I, I think it's that if you don't have it, you need to figure out a way to get it, not through- uh, Well, put it this way. If you're gonna co-sign with anyone, make sure you have some form of credit life insurance, okay? Mm. So at least with that debt, should you pass away, the life insurance for that debt will kick in or some form of credit disability. So if you are disabled and you can't work and you can't do what you need to do to pay the loan, the disability will kick in until you can go return back to work. Or if you're permanently disabled, it will pay the debt. So anytime you're gonna do a joint obligation, make sure you protect the joint owner. Okay, or protect yourself. You could be sold, get the credit life so it won't be a financial burden to your family. Because again, the debt does not die with the debtor. Amen. Amen. And I think if you're able to understand that very simple principle, <laughs> it'll save you a lot of problems in the future and it'll save your family a lot of um a lot of headache in the future. So if possible, try to make sure that not only I what I find with a lot of people with insurance is they never get enough which is fascinating to me. If you ever see one of those, uh, those crazy shows on ID, they, somebody killed the other person for their insurance and it's always like $100,000, $30,000. And I always ask myself, what is that you're planning on doing with the $30,000, right? You may have $30,000 worth of debt. However, there's something called the value of all you do. Meaning if I'm the primary uh, um, caregiver of my children, right? I probably, to watch them, I clean for them, I cook for them. How much does all of that cost? And how much would it cost to replace me in, those, in that particular situation? I think most people overlook those little intangible things when they're trying to figure out how much life insurance that they need. And this applies to everyone, whether you're a freelancer or an employee, you need to make sure that you understand the total of uh, your total value, your total worth, and to determine how much insur life insurance you need. The other type of insurance that I would say you probably need to focus on is uh, health insurance. 
And mm -hmm. obviously everybody, we all know that the Affordable Care Act exists for a reason. Um, and it used to be that if you were a freelancer, you could go to the freelancers union and use their, uh, their platform for um, healthcare, dis healthcare disability insurance. But now they kind of send you through the uh, healthcare.gov website for you to go to, through the open marketplace to figure out what type of uh, insurance makes sense. One thing that most people must understand though is it can be very, very pricely for you to get healthcare on your own. So mm -hmm. if possible, if possible, um, try to see if you can get on either a significant other's <laughs> insurance if they're fully employed by uh, an employer or otherwise try to set up an account so that you have um, money going into that account every month. For example, an HSA. HSA, a health savings account. A health savings account and set up, set aside um, a tax deferred savings account like the HSA, um, such as the HSA and set aside uh, money and savings for future medical expenses. Cause trust me, they will come. You never know what curveball life is gonna throw at you. And the last thing you want is to be stuck with a 30, 40, 100,000 dollar bill. And then you end up having to file for bankruptcy, which is medical bills are the number one cause of bankruptcy in this country. Medical bills is one of the main, one of the top reasons people file for bankruptcy or experience financial hardship exactly. um, next to death exactly. of a family member. Um, for those of you that are creatives, if you are a creative freelancer, there is an organization called Fractured Atlas. They also offer insurance for creatives if you want to look at their... Well, what was that website again? Fractured Atlas, like fractured, like I fractured my spine. Fractured, fractured. Atlas. Atlas. Mm -hmm. Take a look at their website, and they also offer insurance for freelancers as well. If you're um, a, a creative freelancer, graphic designer, writer, photographer, whatever. Um, but they have nice. a great um, platform for creative, um, in, creative people. Wonderful, wonderful. So before we end, mm -hmm. of course, everybody wants to know, so how should we manage our credit and debt as a freelancer? So <laughs> remember what I said earlier about before you start <laughs> and what you need to do before you start, right? Right. One of the things I always tell people is before you even think about going out on your own, if you have tons of debt, right, it'll make it a little hard for you to actually manage your business once you are up and running, right? Mm -hmm. So as far as debt, I always tell people, try to pay off any high interest debt before you get started. If you're already in business, right? If you're already in business, remember that spending account that you created with uh, the different um, branches where you had the taxes, the savings, um, the taxes, retirement, and all of that? Um, one of those sh that you can do for spending and your fixed expenses can be for debt to pay off any high interest debt because you need, a, you need to get any type of high interest debt off your books as soon as possible. If it's not possible for you to do it uh, sooner, um, sooner rather than later, it may mean that it may be time for you to raise your prices, which is something that a lot of people are hesitant to do or figure out how to bring in extra income uh, because the last thing you want to do is have tons of debt as a business owner because you know what's gonna, what that's gonna mean? It's gonna make it very hard for you to scale. And when it comes time for you to scale and you say, you know what, I need funding to scale and you go out to try to get a loan or try to get um, a, a, some type a loan from a bank or even a loan from like a lending club or one of these um, online entities, they're gonna obviously look at your credit score and it's gonna be, make it very, very hard for you to get the loan. One thing um, about credit that I wanna mention is, uh, for uh, a lot of small, small business owners, they don't realize that they need to actually establish credit for their business, uh, their business, um, the entity that they created. So you can do that through Dun and Bra uh, Bradstreet. You can essentially use the website. Uh, Dun and Bradstreet is the website, mm -hmm. and if you go there, you can set up a profile and list your uh, business or your freelance company. And that's a way a lot of companies that um, a lot of organizations that are looking to provide you some type of extend you credit, they use Dun and Bradstreet to check your business credit history. Okay. And, and, what, and, and I agree with you on that, Dun & Bradstreet, because I'm listed with Dun & Bradstreet. Now, here's the thing. If you have a lot of debt and you're swimming in debt, personal debt, mm -hmm. don't try to go and get in credit debt because the stuff got to be paid back, whether you can afford it or not, okay? Now, I know you're thinking it's under my business name or whatever, but you're, you're going to kill the financial reputation of the business if you can't pay it. And most of the time, if you don't have business credit established, you're going to be the principal. So they're going to require you to co-sign 
on that as the principal, which could affect your personal debt. So your personal credit. So just be very careful not to drown yourself in debt because of a great idea. If you can't afford to pay the personal debt that you have, you more than likely won't be able to pay the business debt. So make sure you get the personal debt under control so that you can afford to pay the business debt, whether or not you're going to make money. Because even though we have great ideas and we believe that we're going to make so much money, we may not make a lot of money immediately. Mm -hmm. You know, it may take some time to build up reputation, to build up people to like, know, and trust you, and then to like, know, and trust you enough to pay for your services. Mm -hmm. So that's not being negative, just being realistic that you may have an idea, some ideas, make money off the bat. Some ideas may take five years, seven years, 10 years, but always be prepared for that. So I, I absolutely agree with you on that. Pay, pay down as much as your personal debt as possible, because if you're spending all your money on paying your personal debt and you don't have enough money to contribute to your new venture, why should any lender lend you money for your new venture if you can't even afford to invest in your new venture? So if you can't afford to do it, you can't afford to, if you can't afford to save for it, you can't afford to invest in it, you can't afford to borrow for it. Exactly. And I think one of the things that you just said that um, I think most people overlook is that despite the fact that you may think you have the best idea in the world, unfortunately, sometimes it may be time for you to pivot and try a different strategy. Because what's, if it's not working and if you're not having any revenue coming in, any income coming in, your goal as a, personal, uh, as a freelancer from day one is to bring in income ASAP. And if you can't do that and you're running yourself into debt and you're just living on credit cards, trust me, that's only gonna last ever so long before you drive yourself insane, right? So if something's not working as a freelancer, try to figure out, okay, do I need to raise my prices? Do I need to change my business model? Do I need to give this all up and try something completely different? You know what? It doesn't matter what you try, but the goal is to not continue down the same path where you're just digging yourself into a big, digging yourself deeper and deeper into a bigger hole. Your goal is to try to see if I can bring in income so that I can, if I have any high interest debt, or if I have lots of debt, get rid of that debt as soon as possible so that, you know what, your goal is possible to try to have absolutely no debt. It is possible. Uh, it's not easy, <laughs> right? Because student loans are a mess and you have your mortgage and everything, but it is possible if you're strategic about it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Mina, as always, you're awesome. You're the bomb. Yeah. So how, how can the people connect with you, especially my freelancers or anyone else that want to talk about their investment strategies um, and financial planning and all of that? How can they get in contact with you? Um, a couple of ways. They can tweet me at, uh, at Wealth with Mina, and um, they can send me a message that way, or they can email me directly at Mina at intheblackfinancialwellness.com. And I'm obviously, I'm more than happy to talk to you. Um, for those of you that are interested, I do 30-minute free consultations and financial plans. Uh, so please uh, shoot me an email if you have any questions about your personal finances. And starting in the fall, for those of you who are interested, we are going to be launching all of our online courses so keep an eye out. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, not only personal finance for freelancers, a deep dive, but also investing one-on-one -on -one for those that aren't quite familiar <laughs> with uh, how to get started investing and more importantly, how to make money investing. So keep an eye out for that. Um, more information is going to be available on our, our website in September. Wonderful. Awesome. In the black financial wellness.com. Mina at in the black financial wellness. Dot com also at wealth with Mina so so happy that we had Mina on the line and to share those fun financial yes they're fun for me so I don't know if they're fun for you but <laughs> they are fun they're financial understanding uh, financially understanding your numbers ha just made that up so financially understanding your numbers that's fun <laughs> What financial tips for freelancers. So if you're a freelancer, we gave you some great tips about that. Make sure you connect with Mina or connect with me at Ms. Madam Money on social, on Instagram and Twitter, or go to madamoney.com uh, for my website and get some more tips. And you can also see the other classes that you have. Thank you so much, Mina, for being in the class today and sharing those fun financial tips for freelancers. So appreciate you and for, appreciate all your support with Cash Chat and everything on Twitter. 
Um, make sure you all tune in next week. We're going to be talking about these Bitcoins and cryptocurrency. Yeah. Yeah. I got my boy, Dante Creighton, who does a little bit of that on the side. So he's going to share with us about cryptocurrency and what that's all about. And we're going to have different phases of that. So that's going to be the first session Then we're going to have some advanced sessions on that. But a lot of people have been asking about Bitcoins and cryptocurrency. Well, we have Dante Creighton coming in. And again, if you are on the West side, what, 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 what are you, <laughs> is that how you do it? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what, what side? We want to be on the West side um, Thursday through Monday, but on Saturday, July 22nd, I'm going to be at the Boss Con Boss Brunch Business Owner Success Strategies Mini Conference Boss Con. So if you are out there, there's still time to register. We'd love to connect, collaborate so we can cash some checks in 2017 and 2018. So thank you so much for tuning in to the Madam Money class. Love you. There is nothing you can do about it. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>